Well, good morning. morning. I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. And then I participated in worship, not once, but twice. And then I was really glad because our worship today has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Lord, for that. Greetings to you all. Those of you who are watching online, um, it's Father's Day, for those of you who didn't remember. Let me just ask uh, a, a few questions, if I may, to get started. How many fathers do we have in the room? Would you raise your hand? I was actually hoping for a little bigger response than that. Um, So let me ask you another question. How many of you had fathers? Raise your hand. So much better. Thank you. So with that, we're going to get started. Um, I see we have the wife of one father who's in the Philippines uh, leading a missions trip there, working on a missions trip. We just pray blessings on him. Um, In John 14, 6, Jesus is in the upper room, and he's having a conversation with his disciples as he's getting ready to lead them. And there are a lot of tough things that are said during that meeting. And uh, during the meeting, he makes the proclamation, which is singly the most difficult to accept culturally in the world. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, if you really knew me, you'd know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you've seen him. Philip said, time out, time out. Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. Jesus said to me, him, Have I been with you so long yet you don't know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? So today, folks, we're going to look at a a parable that will hopefully allow us to focus on the Father, his heart, his character, and his love. And as we do that, will hopefully allow us to see where we are in walking in the love that he has provided for us to share. And um, as Pastor Brian so aptly noted last week and reminded us, Phil Stern made a great segue into this series on parables by reminding us that we need to ask the Lord to open our eyes to see the things that we have not seen. We don't know what we don't know. We don't know what we do not know. You know, we have a wonderful ministry here called Celebration Recovery, and as I begin this message, I don't think I would be fair if I didn't start by saying, hi, my name is Bill. I'm a recovering younger brother. I'm a recovering older brother. I am a father who is still learning how to be a father. Because as I look at God's word, I just see that the gap between where he is and where he wants me and where I am is not where, it's not where it should be right now. But, um, but God's gracious. His mercies are new every morning. So um, I want to ask you a question as we get started, okay? A little test question. How many of you went to high school? How many are you young enough to remember that you went to high school? Um, How many of you ate in a cafeteria when you went to lunch? How many of you remember who it is you sat with at the lunch table when you were in high school? Okay, I want to circle. I'm guessing each one of us had a certain circle of people with whom we sat when we ate lunch. How did you choose those you would eat with each day? Was it the in crowd? Was it the band crowd? Was it the football crowd? Was it the cheerleader team? Would it have been those who are regularly res- suspended or misbehaved? Is that who you sat with? <laughs> Did you ever see- seek to sit with the down and outers in school? Why would you have ever done such a thing? And you might be saying right now, Bill, why are you even asking such a question? The reason I'm asking such a question is because there was a guy by the name of Jesus who was asked that question pretty regularly by the religious leaders in his day. In Matthew 9, 10 to 13, Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are weak and sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And as we start the, the, the message for today, we're going to look in Luke 15, 1, a similar s- statement. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him and hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Why did he do this? Why did he do this? Well, here's the reason why, folks, because it says in one of Jesus' primary 
most clarifying mission statement is the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's Luke 19.10. One of his self-proclaimed mission statements. You know, we in Christian Life Church have mission statement, and Pastor Cheryl mentioned it, one of them today. We come to encounter God. We come to receive, uh, experience healing. We come to walk in freedom. We come to live with purpose. Jesus had mission statements too. And you read through the Gospels. I've got a list in my Bible, about nine or ten of them. And all of them point back to this. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to bear witness to the truth. What's the truth? Without God, we're lost. He came to, the Son of God was manifest to do what? To destroy the works of the evil one. What had the evil one done? He'd broken the communion between God and us. It all points back to this. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. In Luke 15, Jesus tells three parables in an attempt to get his listeners, the Pharisees, to understand. You know, Pastor Brian last week read from Matthew, I think it's 13, when his disciples said, why are you talking in parables? He said, because having eyes they don't see, having ears they don't hear. In other words, He's trying to get people to understand that there are things they do not understand and they need to focus. There are things we don't see, we don't understand the way we should. So in the moment, we're going to focus on the parable of the prodigal son. But before that, I want to look at Luke 15, 4 to 10, okay? And he had two distinct stories in an effort to bring before the eyes of the Pharisees the fact that there is a celebration going on in heaven. There's a celebration going on in heaven over an individual sinner repenting and coming back to God. Why why is all this rejoicing going on? Why? Well, because they're celebrating Jesus' fulfillment of his mission statement, and that is to seek and to save that which was lost. So in verse 4, we begin, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. Let me just stop there for a second. How many of you have ever been a sheep herder? Not too many. So I'm going to speak kind of out of my ignorance here. Forgive me for that. If I had 99 sheep out in the wilderness, am I going to lose, leave 99 to try to find one, or am I going to try to protect the nine? seems pretty crazy to do that. And that's why we talk about the overwhelming, reckless love of God who leaves the 99 and go after the one. It's not reckless in the sense of driving with my eyes closed. It's reckless in the sense that it out out achieves anything we could ever even think or hope for. So the first one, and when he goes, he finds it and lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 persons who need no repentance. He's talking about a celebration in heaven, folks, over one, one lost versus 99 righteous. We can talk about the 99 righteous. Then there's a woman who's got 10 silver coins. If she loses one coin, does she... Not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it. When she found it, she calls her friends together, and they have a party again. Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which was lost. Jesus goes on to say, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. So we got one out of 99, one out of 100, and there's a celebration in heaven. We got one out of 10, and there's a celebration in heaven. And, you know, you might ask, The question, okay, Um, the difference between the first two parables that we just read and the one we're going to look at in a minute is, in the first two parables, somebody went out and searched diligently for that which is lost. We're going to see in a minute there's no seeking in the third paragraph, parable, excuse me. The question should come to mind is, who should have gone out and searched for the lost son? Who should have done that? We'll get an answer to that here in a few minutes, I hope. With that, I want to be looking at what is often referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. Sometimes it's spoken of as the parable of the prodigal sons. Other times it's referred to as the parable of the prodigal God. And again, remember, folks, that this story, this parable is told in response to the Pharisees who are saying, why in the world are you hanging out 
with tax collectors and sinners. Why are you doing that? Jesus is trying to get into their blind eyes so they will see what's going on. Luke 15, verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he, the father, divided them to his livelihood. And, and back in that day, the older brother got a double portion. So there were two sons. So the double, older brother got two-thirds. The younger brother got one-third. And not many after days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he'd spent all, there arose a famine, severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went, went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he come to, came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I'll arise, go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worried, worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he's received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to them, Son, you're always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. This parable, folks, I hope we see in the next few minutes, will allow us to focus on the Father God, his heart, his character, his love, and hopefully allow us to see where we are in our relationship with him. So with that, let me just pray. Father, I just pray, Lord, as we look back through this parable, Lord, as we look at your relationship with the sons, God, Lord, that we'll see where your heart is. And hopefully, Lord, you'll give us a glimpse of where our heart is. Maybe we have a little younger brother in us. Maybe we have a little older brother in us. Maybe we have both. Father, that we can change. We can be transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit to be more like what you want us to be. We pray, Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, Lord, so that we can see your word, see your truth, and want to run to it in Jesus' name. So we have here a picture of two sons. And the, younger, the picture Jesus is creating here of the younger brother is one that is intended to create great disdain, hatred, on the part of his listening audience. He has pictured this young man as just the worst kid on the face of the earth, okay? The audience just is going to say, get rid of that guy. The son asks for his inheritance before his dad dies. In essence, the son is saying, I don't want you. I don't want a relationship with you. Just give me what I get when you're dead. In other words, I just want to treat you as dead so I can go live my life the way I want to live it. He wanted no accountability, no relationship with his father. Now, let me ask you a couple questions. Just think back for a second. Was there ever a time in your life when you rebelled against the authority of your parents? How did it work out for you? Work out okay? What is it that causes that rebellion in our hearts? Are there times in your life when you've rebelled against the word of God? How'd that go for you? So what did the father do in this instance of rebellion? Did he demonstrate some tough love? We read 
in the, the, the letter of James in particular, that, you know, God, Hebrews 2, God, God disciplines those he loves. Did he demonstrate tough love? Did he say, over my dead body? Did he banish him from the family? Nope. What did he do? He said, here it is. Go for it. And, and, you know, you might ask, why in the world did the father do this? Why did he give him his inheritance before he was gone? Why didn't he force him to try to stay? Why? How well does it work when you try to force your love onto somebody else? It doesn't work, does it? God, can't, God will not force his love on us. That's why in the garden, Adam and Eve had the ability to say yes or no, and they chose to say no. Here's a picture, folks, of this younger man, child whose mindset is, <laughs> listen to this, you know, I'm going to live my life on my terms the way I want. I want to go where I want to go. I want to stay where I want to stay. I don't want anybody to be, I don't want to be accountable to anybody. It's just going to be for me, myself, and I'm going to have fun. I'm going to go, go, go. I'm going to spend, spend, spend. I'm going to live, live, live. It's going to be wonderful. None of us have ever had that feeling, I'm sure. We're told in this parable he completely wasted his money looking for love, contentment, fulfillment in all the wrong places, trying to fill an empty heart with items that would never, ever, ever get that job done. You know, I've, I've loved reading Jeremiah chapter 2 many times because it talks about we are forsaking the river of life that comes from God in, in favor of cisterns, broken cisterns that will hold no water. Why in the world would we ever want to fill our lives with something that will never bring us contentment? His inheritance is gone. It's gone. He squandered it, completely wasted everything that he'd been given. And, of course, he had to leave in a hurry, folks. He, he couldn't get top dollar for everything because the neighborhood wasn't real happy with him because he was violating the rules. So he didn't have much money to start with. And then as the story progresses, it gets worse. It doesn't get better. It gets worse. And listening audience is now going to say, oh, no, this can't possibly be because then he starts caring for what? Pigs. In the Jewish culture, they didn't touch pigs. They didn't come close to pigs. They didn't have anything to do with it, and he was caring for them. This is adding insult to injury. How could anybody ever do such a thing? They would flee from such a person. Again, Jesus is creating a picture of a person that is absolutely reprehensible in the minds of his audience. Jesus is clearly setting up his audience with the portrayal of this younger son. This younger son's life had become so repulsive, so reprehensible in the way he lived, no one would ever want to have a relationship with him. And yet at this precise moment, the younger son has what some might call an aha moment. What do you mean by aha moment? Well, there's an A, there's an H, and then there's an A. He becomes aware of the filth he's living in. He's aware. He's honest. He said, boy, I've blown it. My father's servants have got it better than me. And then he takes some action. He says, you know what? I'm going to go home and try to make it right. Is he wanting a restoration of the relationship with his father? And we can go a lot into what his mindset was at that point in time. We really don't know, and I don't want to spend any time dwelling on that. But we do, what we do know is while he was a long way off, while he was a long way off, and we don't know if it was relationally distance or both, his father sees him. His father then <laughs> adds to the story in his audience by breaking the current tradition of the culture and starts running after him in his robe. They never did that. That was completely contrary to the culture. Can you imagine Jesus' audience saying, what, 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 why are you doing that? Why? Why? How many of you are familiar with the, the Philip Craig and Dean song? It was written by Benny Hester called When God Ran. It's just an absolutely amazing song talking about the heart of God. You need to make a mental note. Go home on YouTube. It takes about four minutes. When God ran. It's just an amazing song. Talking about the heart of God. He ran because that's the heart of the Father. The Father wanted to restore that which was lost, right? Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He wanted to restore his son's place as a son. He wanted all the community to be aware of the son's return and restoration to the family. So what did he do? He outfitted him with a robe. He gave him a ring. He killed a fatted calf and had a celebrate full of music and dancing. Now, you need to understand back that time, folks. Now, I don't know what kind of dancing it was. I, I kind of never been a very good dancer. Ask my wife. She'll confirm that. Um, anyhow, but they didn't eat meat every day for meals back then. That was expensive. And they certainly didn't have fatted calf except 
in times of celebration. And a fatted calf, I'm told, I'm not a farmer, never had a calf in my life, but I'm told this fatted calf might have had enough to feed as many as 100 people, which meant it wasn't just for five people, it was for the community. He wanted everybody to be aware that this son had been restored into the family. That's what the heart of the, um, the father was. Same picture after the, the 100 sheep, the same picture after the 10 coins, the same picture. As we know, the parable doesn't end there because we see that the older brother was not willing to join the party. The older brother learns of the, the brother's return and his father's response. Let me ask you, let me just kind of take in a side note. Has anybody ever had a relationship with your spouse, your sibling, a close friend, where they come to you and they're just bouncing up and down with enthusiasm? They just can't believe how excited they are at something that just happened in their life, and they share that with you? And you flip the off switch and go back and do something else because it means nothing to you? Has anybody ever had it? I, I had it happen this morning. I'm at home with my wife. I get a text message from one of my brothers. And you understand I have four younger brothers. Three of us are pretty competitive in golf and, and cars and things like that. And my brother had won this card game two nights in a row. And so he had a great big picture of himself with the, the, the scorecard showing that he won. And he sent it to me. My wife said, what is this? And I said, well, my brother won two nights in a row. And she goes, you know, she, it, my wife could care less. And maybe she's right in that. Maybe she should care less. But here's the thing, God. God has a heart. And he wants to know if our hearts are saying this, ah, I don't care, when he causes something to happen in our lives, in our circle of influence. The older brother didn't have anywhere close to the same heart attitude as the father. He was not focused on the lavish love of the father. He was not wanting to even see the love of the father. He was all focused on this, folks, his own sense of, of self-righteousness, his own sense of self-righteousness and getting what he deserved. That's what he was looking at. He said, look at all that I've done. He claims to have been perfectly obedient to his father's commands. You know, I always thought that Jesus was the only perfect child, but maybe we can get so caught up in our own self-righteousness that we forget. <laughs> They're none righteous, no, not one. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. The son goes out, the father goes out looking for him because he's not joining the party. He would think, well, come on, we have to have a celebration. Why? He's not close relationally to what's going on. He had no clue as to where the father's heart was. He says, you've been with me always. All that I have is yours. That's true. Those things are true. The older brothers of the world, myself included, need to see themselves in the picture Jesus is painting and as part of the parable. This part of the parable was aimed primarily at the Pharisees to show them who they were, where they were, and urge them to change. He was alienated because of his own sense of self-righteousness. Now, it might be that one of the reasons the old younger brother took off is he got tired of listening to his older brother talk about how wonderful he was. He said, I can't live with that anymore. You know, here's the deal, folks. The call of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just to pull us away from this self-aggrandizing, self-indulging licentiousness of the younger brother. It's also to pull us away from the moralistic attitude of the older brother. You know, the, I talked about there's a difference between the three parables. In the first two, there was somebody sent out to find that which was lost. In the third one, there isn't. Well, who should have gone? Well, it should have been the older brother. It should have been, but he didn't. Why did he not want to go out and get him? Because of the cost. He knew that if he brought him back, Everything the father had was his, so he's going to lose some of what he would have gotten. Maybe it was just hard, hard to bridge that gap between what the father wanted and what he wanted. The father's call to love and sacrificial giving and serving from a I'm right, I got to do this attitude. Let me just say John Newton, who wrote um, a hymn called Amazing Grace wrote another hymn. He says, Our pleasure in our duty, the opposite before, since we have seen his beauty, are joined to part no more. Then another hymn written by William Cowper says, To see the law by Christ fulfilled and hear his pardoning voice changes a slave into a child and duty into choice. You hear that? What God is saying is, my love should bring your sense of responsibility and the love I've given you together, so you're acting out of love and not duty. 
you're acting from a sense of God's love is so wonderful, I want to do this, not God's love is saying I have to do this. They come together. They come together. And let me say this. If my heart is not for the lost, then there's a disconnect between my father's heart and my heart. I need to reflect on why could that be? Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. If my heart is not for the lost, that means there's a disconnect between my father's heart and my heart, and I need to reflect on why that could be. You know, Jesus said the first and greatest commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. If that's his greatest commandment, that I'm supposed to love him with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. And by the way, I asked this young lady and that young man over there what that meant. Neither one of them could give me a good explanation. What does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart? It's still a work in process, I guess. But I know where his heart is. His heart is for the lost. And if my heart isn't where his heart is, that means there's a disconnect between where I am spiritually and where he wants me to be. You know, Isaiah 66 says very clearly that my righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. Both of these sons were lost, folks. Both of these sons were lost. The father went after both sons. The older brother said he never violated any of the father's laws. He was perfectly obedient. And eh. He didn't have the father's heart. The older brother said, this son of yours. In other words, I don't want any relationship with him. The father said, your brother was dead and is alive again. The older brother was with the father but was disconnected from the heart of the father. Was it pride and selfishness that kept that gap? And so as I was preparing for this, I had to ask myself, and I wrote down, what about me? What about me? He was a prodigal because he did not have the heart of the Father. In varying degrees, in varying ways of our lives, we're all prodigals. You know, in Luke chapter 7, Jesus enters the house of Simon the Pharisee, and it's a great story of a, a woman who had been apparently, it didn't say it specifically, but all believed to be a woman who made her money by being a prostitute. And she came in having been forgiven by Jesus and poured over his, his feet and washed his feet. And this man was so offended that Jesus would even have that contact. And Jesus basically said, he who is forgiven little loves little, but he who is forgiven much loveth much. We've all been forgiven much. And for that reason, we need to say, God, help me love with the love that you have. Okay, I want to take you back. Now, you're thinking, okay, this is all wonderful. But I want, to, I want you to see something here, folks. This isn't just a, uh, the Pharisees who have been blinded by the, the need for obedience in the Old Testament, trying to get their minds around this new covenant. Because in the Old Testament, okay, there's a book called Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 34, there's this presentation that I want to read you just a small excerpt from, okay? It, it, Jesus is in this book, it starts out verse 11, for thus the Lord says the Lord God, and I indeed myself will search for my sheep and seek them out, okay? That's how it begins. So you think maybe the, the Pharisees might have read this before. It goes on in verse 16, I'll seek what was lost and bring back which was driven, driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick, but I will destroy the fat and strong and feed them in judgment. In other words, our heart needs to be with the broken, the sick, not sitting back fat, dumb, and happy saying, oh, and I agree. That's what God's heart is. God's heart is for those who are lost, driven away, broken, and we need to be there to help strengthen them. So with that, two things. I want to just, I want to pray as we conclude, and we're going to conclude by, I'm going to pray the scripture from Ephesians 3, but before that, I want to just challenge you. If you feel like you're, you're separated from the love of God right now. I want you to, after we get done here, reach out to somebody and say, hey, can you help me pray back myself into a relationship? Because God is right there. He is right there. He is right there. And if you feel at the same time that maybe you're looking down, you're a little judgmental, that maybe you have a little older brother in you, all we have to do is repent and say, Father, please forgive me because your mercies are new every morning. Open up my heart to show me ways, Lord, that I can serve in love. Serve in love. Not in duty, but in love. Father, we thank you today for 
this day, Lord, where we have the opportunity to look on Father's Day at the heart of the Father. And I think, Father, a lot of us are like Philip, sitting in the upper room, having been with you for three years, saying, show us the Father, show us the Father. But you did that, Lord, in this parable. You showed us where your heart is and where you want our heart to be. And I pray, Father, that we, Lord, will not be like the older brother. We certainly don't want to be like the younger brother, but we also don't want to be like the older brother. We want our heart and mind to be joined to yours, Father. And with that, Lord, I'm just going to pray Ephesians 3. The Apostle Paul prayed, and we're going to pray. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.